We've done a lot of work with definite integrals. We found how to find the value of a definite integral using the limit definition, and we saw how to find the value of a definite integral using the fundamental theorem of calculus. And that gave us exact values for our definite integrals. Now with the limiting definition, it had to be something that we would be able to do our formulas for our summations and get those replacements so we could find the limit as n approached infinity. And there's certain functions that lend themselves to be able to do that, but others that just don't. With the fundamental theorem of calculus, we needed to find an antiderivative of our integrand to then evaluate it at the upper limit of integration minus the lower limit of integration. And that's all well and good as long as you can find your antiderivative. But what if you have a continuous function over a closed interval and you want to find the definite integral of that um, function, but you don't have an antiderivative for it, nor is it something that lends itself to do the summation replacements? Well, in those cases, if we can't find the exact value of our definite integral, at least we can approximate it. Now, we saw approximations of the definite integral using rectangles and putting in many sub-rectangles, adding up those areas of those sub-rectangles in order to get us our value of our definite integral. But there are actually other types of figures that we can use and formulas for areas that we can use and then extend them to just getting our approximation for our definite integrals other than just the rectangles. The first rule that we have for this is the trapezoidal rule. So I'm going to use trapezoids instead of rectangles to get my approximations. And it turns out that in most situations, it takes much fewer trapezoids to get our better approximations to the definite integral. So that means it's less work but instead of the rectangles. And then Simpson's rule is actually where we're going to take a at a time and actually fit our curve with parabolas, which again will give us a better approximation with less subintervals corresponding to then less calculations that have to be done to attain a specific level of accuracy. So let's get started getting the background of both of these rules. First of all, with the trapezoidal rule. Well, you want to remember some things about trapezoids, right? A trapezoid is a quadrilateral where exactly one pair of opposite sides are parallel. Now, most of the time you have seen trapezoids that probably look like this. And we know that the parallel sides, the ones that are running parallel to each other, those are called the bases. And then we have this pair of non-parallel sides. Well, we also know from geometry, it's not the orientation in the page that makes the difference. So I could certainly also have a trapezoid that looks like that. So still though, the parallel sides are called the bases, even though now they're running vertical instead of it being sat on that. And meeting that requirement that I have exactly one pair of opposite sides being parallel, I could actually take this bottom and draw it across horizontally and then have my angled side, this is still going to be a trapezoid. And when we did our trapezoids in geometry and we we're looking at the area of a trapezoid, remember we had our bases and we had the height between the two bases. So if you held them, your hands on either side of the bases and looked at the distance between your hands, that was your height. So our area of our trapezoid is one half the height times the sum of the two bases. Well, when I sit my trapezoid upright like this, my b sub one and my b sub two are the vertical edges of my figure. And if these are running vertical and my other side is running horizontal, they're perpendicular to each other, and that distance between them is going to coincide with the height of the trapezoid. So we're not used to seeing it like this. We're used to seeing it 
sitting at its bases, but the orientation in the page does not determine what the figure is. It's the characteristics of the figure that determines it. So that's still our trapezoid. And I wanted to go through that a little bit because it's really important that we visualize it that way when we look at the trapezoidal rule. So then, what is it that we're looking at in terms of finding our approximation to our definite integral if we're not able to find it exactly using our either limiting definition of the definite integral or our application of the fundamental theorem of calculus for the definite integral, how can we approximate it? Well, if we're looking at the trapezoidal rule, we're looking at our function y equal f of x the x-axis from the start at A, the end at B, so that region. And actually we're adding up all of the function values and that will take care of itself even if I'm looking at a definite integral of a function that does go negative over the interval. It'll come out the way it needs to be within the work of the trapezoidal rule. So here if I'm looking at breaking this interval up into n equals subintervals and drawing where I start and I end for my subintervals, I go up to the function, but instead of coming horizontally across, I connect those two function values. And that gives me this slanted part of it. So I make a trapezoid now instead of making a rectangle. So that's why this is called the trapezoidal rule as opposed to the approximations we did before when we had rectangles. So again, the next one we're gonna draw and we're going to connect our, end, our function values at the endpoints of the subintervals as we go. And see how much better that conforms to the function as you go than when we had the rectangles so that's why we get a much closer approximation to the actual value of the definite integral using trapezoids than when we used rectangles. So now, how does that play out in terms of giving us our value approximation to the definite integral? Well, for each of the spaces in between, remember we found our delta x by b minus a over n. And our output function values had to be at each of the x values that are at our sub intervals. So a was our x sub 0. And then my x sub 1 I get by a plus a delta x. My x sub 2 I get a plus 2 delta x, you're just adding a delta x along the way, and b is actually going to be our x sub n, which is a plus n delta x. And in practicality of doing the application, we would actually put the numbers in to get our x values at those subintervals and then run them through the functions for our height. So this first output value is f of x sub 0. The next output value is f of x sub 1. So the area of this first trapezoid is 1 half delta x between each of these is a delta x. So 1 half delta x, f of x sub 0 plus f of x sub 1. That's going to give us our first one. Now, I'm going to write this out the long way before we clean it up to where it will be in its final form. So just kind of follow along to start with. And if you want to then put it in your notes, 
you can go ahead and rewind to the earlier part where it got started and then write it into your notes. So for this first area of this first trapezoid, it's one half delta x times f of x sub zero plus f of x sub one. Now we're gonna add to it the area of this next trapezoid. But notice my start of my second trapezoid is the right side of my first trapezoid. So I'm still going to need for this second one, my one half times delta x, but then f of x sub one plus f of x sub two. Plus, and we keep going along until we get to the last one. And actually, let's do the second to the last one and then the last one. We have our plus one half delta x of f of x sub n minus two plus f of x sub n minus one. And then the last one is plus one half delta x times f of x sub n minus one plus f of x sub n. Now, we can actually clean this up a bit. Notice every single one of these areas that we're adding together of the trapezoids have a common factor of one half from the formula for the area of the trapezoid, and a delta x for the height, the distance between those parallel sides of the trapezoid. So I'm gonna factor that one half delta x out. And I can do that here because I've chosen to do my delta x's as equally with subintervals. If you have a situation where you're asked to do the trapezoidal rule and they didn't have you do equal width subintervals, they give a different width for your subintervals as you go along, then you can't factor out a delta x because it won't be the same throughout it. So you would need to leave it in the longer format of your trapezoidal rule and figure it out there. But because they're equal width, I can factor that out as a common factor and look what happens. I have my f of x sub zero plus my f of x sub one, and then plus, but one half delta x came out. So then I'm gonna have a plus f of x sub one plus f of x sub two plus, and that sort of pattern's going to keep going until right before the last one, we're going to have our f of x sub n minus one, and then plus my f of x sub n. So my definite integral approximation using the trapezoidal rule when I have equal width subintervals, there are some like terms you can combine here. I have f of x sub zero, and then I have f of x sub one plus another f of x sub one, which is two f of x sub ones plus, and then f of x sub two plus another f of x sub two will be two f of x sub twos plus all the way out until right before the end, you'll have two f of x sub n minus ones, and then plus lastly, my f of x sub n. And now we went through a lot of messy notation to get here, but mainly you're only going to have one function value at the start and at the end. But all the way through the middle, each of our function values shares to two different trapezoids, the one that it's the right side of and the other one that it's the left side of. So that's why you have that coefficient of two in each of those. And now one last thing that a lot of times they will show you when they just give you the formula for the trapezoidal rule 
is they will actually look at definition is, so if you have one half times this B minus A over N, they'll show it as B minus A over two N times that F of X sub zero plus two times F of X sub one plus two times F of X sub two plus all the way out to two times F of X sub N minus one and then plus f of x sub n. And when they first have us do this, they're going to give us the specifics, how many subintervals that we're supposed to have. So they'll give us our n. They'll give us our start of our interval, our end of our interval. So we'll have our a and our b. We'll be able to make our subintervals to run those through our function and then be able to calculate our approximation to our definite integral using the trapezoidal rule. Um, in a later segment, there'll be a description and work with how you determine how many subintervals you need to do for the trapezoidal rule and then also for Simpson's rule if you have a specific accuracy that you want to attain with your approximation. For these early ones, it's just running your values through. Now for Simpson's rule, We approximate it using parabolas. So we use it to um, parabolas to approximate. So we're getting actually curved, and we have to take three points at a time and attach them. Now, that's beyond the scope of the development of it for this video, but I will show you what the formula is for it. So for Simpson's rule, it's the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx can be approximated by its b minus a over 3n, and again, the description of why that's a 3 is in the development of using the parabolas to approximate it and then it's times f of x sub zero plus four times f of x sub one plus two times f of x sub two plus four times f of x sub three and then you keep going out until it's four times f of x sub n minus one and then plus f of x sub n and specifically in Simpsons n must be even. Because I have to take those two subintervals at a time to get three dots. So I also, I always have to have it even. Now, if you think about that, this four coefficient that's showing up comes because of the parabola fit. The two coefficient comes because of the shared side. So if you do two subintervals together to get the three dots, and then you do that again, this is where you get your two, is where they one stopped and the other one started up. Okay, now with these formulas,